I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're speaking with Stephen Grabiel, who is an experienced technology writer and consultant. He has dedicated his career to helping people navigate the complexities of the digital world. In Reboot Nation, a guide to the internet for the technically challenged, he breaks down the basics of internet connections and how to optimize them, making the online experience more accessible for everyone. Through his clear, concise explanations and practical advice, he aims to empower readers to feel confident and well-equipped in their digital lives. We are delighted to have Stephen join us today in the spotlight. We thank the folks at Authors Reputation Press for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like him by subscribing to our channel. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us here today. Well, thank you, Logan. I appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, discuss my book. It's my pleasure. It's a terrific book. It's a must-needed guide, I think, for most households, because nowadays in particular, where there's so much remote work, we need to make sure our connection is as strong as possible. If you were to give the little golden nugget right off the top right now, what would you say the number one thing people could do to ensure a high-speed, high-quality connection online? What would that be? Reboot. It's like the <laughs> name of the book, Reboot. And that's just simply unplugging power to the equipment for 30 seconds and then plugging it back in. That basically restores and cleans up all the dust bunnies in your computer or your routers or what have you to deliver your internet. Exactly. So it's as simple as that on one level that we Correct. just need to turn it off, in some cases unplug it as well to make sure that it is fully rebooting, correct? Absolutely. I tell a lot of my customers to unplug it and leave it unplugged for 30 seconds to a minute because computers and cell phones and everything, they are transformers and they store energy and you need to dissipate all that energy out to refresh in it. You know what I notice a lot is I will order for my home or my office a one gig connection. And then when I test it, I'm only getting about half or three quarters of the speed. Why do you think that is? Well, a lot of it has to do with those oversubscription. <clears throat> a lot of it has to do with the computers, mostly of your computers. A lot of the people buy a one gig connection. They don't even know what that means. But if you run a speed test for that speed and you don't have a gigabit connection to your computer, then you will not see those speeds. If you're seeing two, 300 megabits at your house and you're paying for a gig, it's probably because you've got a whole bunch of other devices drawing bandwidth from the same router, if you will, that is impacting your ability to run a full speed test to see the one gig that you are talking about. And I would imagine if at all possible, it's always a great idea to use an ethernet connection, right? Absolutely. Um, you're with wireless technology, how it's changed over the decades, things, things have gotten better, but always a wired connection. And that's what I recommend to my people that uh, like work from home. Let's not get on the wireless because there's too many invariabilities there as opposed to a cabled in connection to your computer. There's so much new technology. If you want a fast connection, I would think for most folks, their computers shouldn't be any older than a year, maybe two. Do you agree? Depending on their applications, if you're uh, elderly and you're at home and you just use it to communicate with the grandkids and stuff, maybe you don't have to. But if you make a living online, that is a, a good recommendation for your audience. One of the advancements I've seen lately is what they call high-speed Wi-Fi or 6E Wi-Fi. Tell us a little bit about that. That's just the changing technology. It's like the 5G that you hear about that the cell phone companies are using out there. It's just a another method of utilizing the spectrum, which means the airwaves that you're using to receive your, your connection to your internet. Now remember, if you're buying a router with 6E, your computer has to be 6E capable as well to receive the full speed of what you're paying for. And even with 6E, they may tout one gig, but I highly doubt you will get 
one gig through a wireless connection. Let's talk a little bit about your book. Why did you write it? There were two specific reasons I wrote this book. The first was for my customers, after being for years in this industry and hearing the same thing day in and day out, I said, there's got to be a way to get this information out to my clients and to help them along with their path. I mean, when people call my office for service, I offer a fiber optic connection as well as wireless connections. About 90% of my customers are wireless. By and large, nine times out of 10, a simple reboot, like we talked about earlier, unplugging the power will get you your speed back. It's just these computers and routers and stuff. And a router is a computer. It just doesn't have a screen. They get dust bunnies in them and from all the processing that they're doing, and they just need to be refreshed. So I was thinking to myself, how can I get this out to people that a reboot is necessary and writing a book was the way to do it. And on top of that, when people call into my office, I may not be able to deliver what they're expecting or what they would wish in rural, rural America. And we, you know, in my book, I tell them about the different technologies out there that deliver your broadband or fast internet connection. The other reason why I wrote this book is for the other internet service providers out there like myself to be able to educate their customers on the simple tasks that they can do to make their connection all that it can be. And that's the primary reason behind writing the book, to help people. Well, you certainly do that because there's great advice throughout. Um, it really is a challenge for people in rural areas to get strong internet. Uh, I was one of the people who decided to move during COVID from the New York City area to a rural area. And I looked at New Hampshire, I looked at Vermont. Vermont was out of the question. You couldn't get high-speed internet there. And if you were gonna be a remote worker, you needed a high-speed connection. So what is your advice for people who do live in these areas where, you know, one gig isn't heard of yet? Well, we get the people come moving into rural New Mexico where I'm uh, at today and where I provide services to. And they call me and, com and commonly tell me I need a, a gigabit connection or I need a hundred plus megabits. Well, I tell them I can deliver that, but that's not in our standard package. And I give them a price for what it would cost and they don't realize the effort and resources it takes to deliver that. I tell my folks at the office, you know, we can provide whatever speed they want. It just depends on how much money they're willing to spend. And by and large, these people, they come from urban areas such as yourself with these expectations. And the reason why you can expect those expectations is because the population density for providers like myself and the big people like Comcast and your CenturyLink, your Lumen, those folks, they invest in those areas where they have a population density that justifies all the upgrades. Like you said, you have a gigabit connection at your house. Obviously you have enough people around you to justify them bringing that in. Exactly. Could you uh, repeat the question? As I don't think I had a No, you answer. basically did answer it. You said basically in the rural areas, people can get the high-speed connections if they want it, but they're going to have to pay for it. Uh, Correct. It's not as commonplace as it is if you're living in Metro Tampa or Metro New York or even Albuquerque. You get outside of Albuquerque and uh, the population tends to be a little sparse. Tell us right. a little bit about your business, uh, what you offer, what type of business it is. Right, well, my business is higher speed internet and we're based out of Moriarty, New Mexico. And back in 2000, 2000 in the infancy of this technology, and this is, a, I would I consider it to be the latest industry out there because back in 2000, this was in its infancy and we had brought out wireless internet and we were dealing with a one megabit connection that we were sharing to, with people. Mm -hmm. And back in those days, it was, you know, people just wanted faster uh, than a dial-up connection so they could get their email quicker. And that was adequate. I just go back to the days when we started doing this and I only had a meg and a half mm -hmm. of internet to give out and we were able to have a hundred people on that. Yeah. Well, things have changed, you know, 20 years later, we're here with a, a 10,000 megabit connection to the internet. 
serving eight, 900 people, 15 megs to five megs, 15 megs down and five megabits upload. And it just blows me away. 15 by five back in 2000 was unheard of. And no one could, I, as a provider, I'm a wholesale, I'm a reseller of wholesale bandwidth. And there was no way in the world I could afford even a 15 by five circuit that I'm selling for 50 or a hundred dollars a month these days. So the, this industry has really come a long way. And like you said about changing computers, that's the one downside of this thing. It's not like the electric company where you string up a power line and put up a transformer and it'll last 50 years without problem or have to be replaced unless lightning strikes. Like you mentioned, every 18 months and you, you live online, you need to get a new computer. Well, same with me to keep up with the latest technology. I have to go out there and invest and upgrade. And that's not only the infrastructure that delivers it to the house, but also the equipment on the people's houses. So, you know, there's a there's a churn rate of equipment and technology that has to be modernized every so often. Well, I think you provide a valuable service to people, particularly in your area, because if you call big cable to deliver Wi-Fi for you, you're going to get a one size fits all um, solution that might not be a solution for you at all. It sounds like you're really a niche business that is targeting consumers who have special um, needs, special expectations, and you can help them fulfill that. Correct, correct. And I also provide fiber optic connections. About five years ago, we started plowing fiber into the ground and running it to people's homes. And that's been really good for those co customers that I am able to deliver that to. Um, the capacities are way higher, like you were talking about gigabit connections. I am able to deliver that, of course, if they're willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the technologies that this business here in New Mexico has gotten into. And like you said, the big Comcast and those folks, they they can come in and they can do all the same things, but they'll tell you, oh, we can deliver it. And then they will never show up and deliver it. Exactly. And that's where we, that's where our niche market comes in. We can deliver. And, you know, the expectation of these folks that come from urban areas into rural areas is that they don't really realize that even though you have a gigabit connection to your house, and that's wonderful, don't get me wrong, I'm all for it, you'll never utilize 10% of it. Mm -hmm. And it's just like the cellular commercial that you see. If you were going to take a bath, would you fill up a swimming pool? And why would you pay a high dollar amount for that? bath that's a swimming pool it's just not necessary it's exactly. just people don't realize and it's because the bigger companies want to say we can offer you a gig well you'll never ever use a gig mm. even if you have 20 devices on your wireless you'll never use it yeah well i think that's what people don't understand is they right. see 500 megabytes they see one gig and everybody wants the biggest and the best you know they might want a ford right. bronco but they're never going to take it off road so why do they need yeah. tires that are 37 inches big right and the same thing's right true the with the internet um what do you think the needs are for most consumers about what range what should they be looking for i'm able to i've done tests uh, back in the day when i didn't have the bandwidth that i currently have I was able to watch a Netflix stream at 768K. Now I had to set the Netflix to seven uh, to standard definition, and I could watch a stream with 300 people on my network and throttle myself down to 768K and watch the stream without any buffering. Nowadays, I'm selling people, and my cheapest plan is like eight megabits down by two megabits up, which you're probably laughing at, but that's what reality is out here. Yeah. Eight megabits by two will support two or three TVs online at the same time using standard definition and no buffering. The problem that arises is these people, they because electronics are so dirt cheap, they buy all these electronics, get them online, like your, your ring doorbell, all these other devices, they consume bandwidth. And when you have a lot of devices consuming bandwidth, you're buffering with your Netflix and your Amazon will be eventually happening. Now I do add the caveat, when I did stream at 768K, that TV was the only thing online at the time. Right, right. 
Yeah. Um, for me, I noticed a huge difference when I tried to use less than one gig when it came to uploading videos. Right. It was much, much faster if I had, you know, broader bandwidth. Absolutely. And that's the difference between upload and download. Download, you can compare it to listening and upload is speaking. And a lot of uh, services give you a lot of listening capacity download, but they limit you to a lot of upload or down upload is limited. And in your, in your world, an upload is incredibly important because you are recording things like this and then you're mm -hmm. uploading them to a server somewhere in the world so that people can download. So in your case, a, a symmetric internet pipe of one gig up and one gig, gig down will make a dramatic improvement in your life. But the typical consumer is more watching video content and, and such. If you are talking to uploading, then yeah, a faster upload is required. Absolutely. Is there a way for folks to test their internet connections, the speed of it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I use this daily when I'm out doing installs for new clients is I'll go to a website called www.speedtest.net mm -hmm. and that'll load up. And then there's a huge go button in the center and you hit that and then it will pick a server, hopefully closer to you that will test to. And in that case, you will see the speeds that you are getting. Now, remember, if you're on a gigabit connection, that's a thousand megabits. If you're on a thousand megabit connection and your computer is only rated at a hundred megabits, typically you will only see the hundred megabits because you are throttled down by the technology you use. Gotcha. So that's why we were saying right at the beginning of the interview, if you do need for whatever reason, if it's a work purpose, you got to have the, not only the latest equipment, but the best chip out there the best graphics driver in your uh, computer as well, if you're going to maximize absolutely. that that uh, connection that you're paying for. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I found something interesting, what you said before was rebooting your modem. Now that's something I never do. In fact, I kind of like leave it alone because I'm like, it's working, all the lights are on. I don't want to mess with it. But you think it's a good idea from time to time to actually unplug the modem and reboot it, right? I wrote a book on it. I mean, back <laughs> exactly. in the day, back in the day when, you know, Windows XP or even earlier Windows Six, it required you when you had to do some changes to your networking. It required you to reboot the computer. That was painful because these things took forever to boot up. But right. technology has changed. We don't have to do that. What I recommend to my folks is to unplug power to the modem. And modems are simply it's a computer that routes traffic. The only difference is it doesn't have a keyboard or a screen to look at. And you can log into your router from your desktop there just by typing in its IP address and getting to it. But yeah, I highly recommend even people on gigabit connections. And this, this is what I tell people when I'm out in the field daily. We recommend you do it once a month just to keep all the dust bunnies out and it helps the data flow. And when we're sitting around at the office with nothing better to do, we'll be logging into your equipment and doing that for you because we see the value in doing that. And, and typically a reboot is only a 30 second ordeal. So you're down for 30 seconds. And when I'm logging into people's stuff, nine times out of 10, they're not even online. So they won't even notice the hiccup. That's great. So you can actually access their modem and their computer if they'd want as well remotely. Right. I offer in my business, I offer a managed router uh, feature to the services I provide. And the reason I do that is when people call me to tell me that their internet's slow, I can log into their router and see they've got 15 devices and that this device here is downloading. It, it's gobbling up all your bandwidth. For example, back when Windows 10 had some updates and stuff, what it would do is it'd capture 100% of the bandwidth, the speed going into your house and not allow anything else to flow. And people would call me saying the internet's really slow. Mm. Well, this computer, it looks like it's downloading everything. Is it doing an update? Yeah, it's doing an update. Okay, well, when that's done, you're gonna be able to do everything you normally would. Unfortunately, Windows grabbed 100% of your speed. Gotcha. For its gotcha. update. So you gotta watch out for those vampires that are sucking away at your uh, bandwidth Absolutely. that you're not aware of. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Setting up a home Wi-Fi network, um, is that difficult for most consumers to do on their own? Do they generally need to turn to a professional? No, it, the, the consumer grade stuff that you see out in the field, it's extremely powerful. It's a very good product. The, the products are very good. The technology's come a long way and they do make it pretty much plug and play. In my world with uh, wireless, I'm delivering internet to people in a similar spectrum that they are broadcasting out in their home Wi-Fi router. So what I what I try to do is get the people to turn off or change the channel, put their channels on their Wi-Fi router in the five gigahertz because that's what I'm delivering their internet to. I try to get them to set it to auto so that it doesn't step on the same channel that I'm bringing the internet into because like a pirate radio station that I'm pretty sure you remember were out there in the days you'd be listening to your favorite radio station and then a pirate radio would step all over that and you wouldn't hear what you wanted to hear. Well, the same thing is true in the wireless world. If you have a router broadcasting on say channel 53 and your wireless provider like myself is delivering that service to you on channel 53, there's gonna be interference and that's gonna cause the packets in your Wi-Fi to go, where do I go? It just causes grief. And when people want to add a router onto the, the equipment I provide them, I, I happily do that for them, but I turn off the five gigahertz so that it doesn't cause, I try to prevent that from the get-go. But to your question, the consumer grade routers that you're buying out there from your best buyer, wherever, they're very good, they're very powerful. And I would go to say is they're too powerful, even though they're limited by what they can transmit they do interfere with services like mine. In this very mobile age where people are trying to work on their back porches and so forth, extending the range of their Wi-Fi is often important. Is it possible for a consumer just to pick up a device that will repeat the signal or extend the signal? Uh, do they work? Uh, what's your advice on that type of scenario? Well, and I see that in a lot of situations, uh, you know, they have the Wi-Fi in the house and then the dad has the garage or the dog house and he wants Wi-Fi out there. And that's fine. There are wireless repeaters that you can uh, add to your network to extend that range. I really, in my world, being a wireless provider, on people on my, on my fiber optics, I don't care because they're not going to interfere with the light. Fiber mm -hmm. optics is light, basically. But in Wi-Fi, I try to steer them away from these wireless extenders. They will work, but they just cause more interference in your home. What I recommend is an Ethernet over power line adapter, and it's simply a little device you plug into your wall outlet or you plug your router in. You put an Ethernet jack into it. Then you take the other extender out to the garage, plug it into the outlet, and then you have the Wi-Fi in there. You are using the power lines that your electrician wired in your house to extend that to wherever you want. And that works pretty well. And it keeps the spectrum that we, that internet providers like I use cleaner. That is interesting. I didn't realize that. In fact, I actually have that technology in my home. I just didn't know how it works. We have a pod that repeats the signal to other parts yeah. of the home. That Those pod is plugged into the wall, like you described. So I'd imagine that's also using electricity to transmit. Right. It's using, well, your wireless, the same. You plug one in and it takes your Wi Fi signal and it rebroadcasts it out to the other device that receives that. Mm -hmm. What I recommend is keeping that spectrum in your household clean and keep the Wi Fi to a minimum and do it through the power lines through the convenience outlet you plug your cell phones into and your computers and your router. Sounds great. Sounds like a terrific solution. What are your thoughts on VPNs? Do most people need them? Virtual private network? You see the ads and the stuff from everyone wanting to protect you and secure your connection. In my business, I'm not about selling and I don't have the time to buy or sell information like that. And I don't really care what you do. Mm. In, in my case, I use a VPN to get to my network from an outside connection. Say I'm in a different city and I need to fix something. I will use a VPN to get to my internet. But for the average consumer, 
if the price points under 10 bucks, yeah, it's it's a safe. You are going to your internet. It's it's an encrypted safe tunnel that is created between you and the provider of the VPN. So it makes it look like your traffic is not coming from your house, but your traffic is coming from that server wherever you're buying the service from. It 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 can be a benefit. It keeps hackers from being able to see that stuff, but in reality with a good encrypted router and you got a supplier like me that encrypts its data, it's not necessarily, it could be worth it, but the way that, that uh, technologists like myself, we have encryption on our stuff to where you are protected. Yeah. Yeah, and it seems like most hackers wouldn't be targeting Mary Jones living in an average neighborhood. They're going after right. businesses that would have a lot of data that they need rather than individually targeting uh, consumers. Right. You spoke a little bit about fiber optics, and I think that's interesting because I think a lot of people don't understand the value that it brings. Talk to us a little bit about the different types of internet connections that are available to consumers today. Yeah, across the country, you've got your DSL, that that kind of, uh, when it came to town back in 2000, when we were doing this, it kind of put a kibosh on what I was doing, but we survived. That's, uh, that's a technology that uses your telephone lines that come to your house. They just simply put in a device called a DSLAM out at the, where the telephone box is, and then they have the electronics there that push data to you. And that worked well, but like I said, companies don't uh, invest in rural areas unless they're given money by the federal government to upgrade those. So I've gained back a lot of those customers because I'm able to deliver faster service. There's, you know, your satellite providers, uh, those that are low earth, like Starlink, and then you got the high earth orbit ones, The and those pretty much anywhere you can see the south skies, you have an internet connection. Um, then there's fixed wireless, like my product, where you have a tower and a home, and we broadcast to your home through that. You got your mobile telephones. It's very similar to fixed wireless, except the fact that when you're driving along the road, your signal hops to the next tower seamlessly to where you don't recognize a drop, as where what I do is fixed. And then you wanted to talk about fiber optic. Well, fiber optic, it's at a 30,000 foot level, it's really simple. In the wireless and satellite world, your medium of transport is air, okay? Those signals go through the air. In DSL, that's copper, that's coming across your copper telephone lines. The fiber optics, it's a strand of fiber that it's been extruded to about the size of a human hair. And what they do is they put a laser on one end and all that does is flashes light. All the internet really is, is ones and zeros. I'm an electrical engineer and it's either on or it's off. Well, in the world of internet, it's flashing that light, fiber optic, it's flashing that light on and off a gazillion times a second. And then that's how you get your internet through that. The reason why fiber optic is the best, if you can get it, is simply because the capacity is unlimited. Mm -hmm. You can put devices on these things as a provider. You can put devices on these fiber optic cables that will provide you unlimited. You talked about a gigabit connection at your house. Mm -hmm. Well, if you were willing to pay for it, you could get 10, 40, mm -hmm. 100. You could get multiples of 100, but your computers would never be able to catch up. That's why I laugh at some of the providers saying we've got a 10G network. Right. Well, what does that mean? To me, that means 10 gigabits per second. But the simple fact is, is, if I plug a router in or a computer in, I don't know of a computer that will do a 10,000 megabit speed test. Right. So you would never know what you're getting. Yeah. The only people who need something like that are people who are mining for crypto or something who have supercomputers. Um, but it's like right. you said in the beginning, it's a lot of it's marketing. It's not necessarily what's best for the consumer, but it's what's best for the company, which is what's great about and proprietorship like yours is where you can actually give practical hands-on advice to consumers who need an interconnect connection, but don't necessarily need the uh, highest end Mercedes of it all and waste exactly. all that money. Mm -hmm. 
for sure. Not really necessary. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, as we end the interview, what would you like the folks at home to know about your book? Like I mentioned, the reason I wrote it is to help people understand the mediums of which they can get their internet throughout the country that are currently available. Now, I wrote this book a few years ago, and since then, the low orbit, low Earth orbit satellites weren't available, and now they are. It's just to gain knowledge about what you're buying, and it's written in a way, hopefully, that someone who reads it could understand the language that I'm saying. I mean, like I said, I'm an electrical engineer, and I'm a geek by heart. But I wanted to write something to where the typical consumer could read it and go, okay, so if I unplug power to this, that may make my internet connection better. Absolutely. And that's like I tell all my customers that I visit with, try this first, and if it doesn't work, then give us a call, and we'd be happy to help you log into it and see what we can do to make things better and root out the problem, root out the cause for your problem. That's that's the primary thing I wish people to get from this. And plus, they're in the book. There are a lot of um, ticks, tips and tricks that can be used. Like back 10 years ago, we've got a generation now that has never not known the Internet. And these kids are brilliant and everything. Back in the day when I was doing this and providing a broadband connection, a fast Internet connection just for fast email, Technology was changing. There was this Napster product out there that was basically doing copyright infringement and how that's done. That's a topic for another discussion, but it, it, it was illegal. Uh, and these parents had no idea what, what their kids were doing. And the, the parents would get these notices from people like me saying, we've seen this traffic come across your internet pipe and there are people that have been fined lots of money for doing this. So yeah. please hammer down on your kids. Well, how do I tell that they're doing it? A lot of that has gone away since the encryption of the, of these connections. ISPs like myself can't see it. All we can see is the amount of data going through, but those are things that I point out in the book that maybe you should know what your kids are doing online. Of course, you hear that all the time on all the news and everything, pay attention to what your kids are doing. Yeah. But a lot of the parents don't know the technologies it's changing. It's like TikTok came around. I don't even know what tip TikTok is. <laughs> don't really care. Right. But I, you know, it's just the changing technology and not being up to date on all of it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's important to stay up to date. One of the emerging technologies that I guess will be a game changer, and you talked about it just a little bit, is this uh, low Earth satellite. I guess that's what Elon Musk is investing a lot in. And this will open up internet connections to people who normally can't get them? Correct. It's just like the satellite connections that you've had for years. The, the difference is between satellite and providers like me and your Century Links and your Comcast, and I'm not so sure about Comcast, is how you buy it. Um, they do things called data caps. You've been on your cell phone and you've gotten a bill for going over your data cap and pay more money, right? Well, the satellite industry's taken a black eye for doing this because if you downloaded or you watched five streaming movies uh, from your favorite streaming provider, they would throttle you down to something or charge you more money. And that really angered a lot of people in my industry. And what I do is I don't care how much you download. You can download a terabit of data, which is like a lot of data in a month and I don't care. But the following caveat that I tell people when they call in is if you do download a terabit of data and you tell me that the internet is slow, I'm going to tell you it is physically impossible for you to download what you've done on a slow connection. Yeah. So you need to monitor what you're doing, but go ahead and watch all the movies you want. Leave Netflix running 24 seven. I don't care yeah. as were the other companies. And I'm a consumer of my competition's service. And recently I've got a email from them saying that if you go over X amount, we're going to start throttling you down. And mm. that's just a problem with capacity. And yeah. they're going to experience that. And my guess is, is you're going to see with the Elon Musk product, 
you're going to see them throttling people down or charging them more. I mean, I've already gotten a bill increase from what I was paying, you know, and in my industry and what how I run businesses, I've never raised my rates, even though we have this pandemic, we had the pandemic and we were scurrying around and we've got this hyper inflation. I've kept my rates level and haven't really affected those. The only thing is, is I offer faster speeds for more money, which I have to admit, I'm blessed to be in an industry where enough is never enough. Right. So people, they're willing to pay in excess of $100 for faster speed. It's like the internet is more important to them than the power. And I have to tell them, do you have power at your house? No. Well, the internet's not going to run without power. Absolutely. Absolutely. Stephen Grabeel has written a terrific book. It is called Reboot Nation, a guide to the internet for the technically challenged. It will answer a lot of your questions about your service, what you need, how to optimize the uh, service that you get into your home. It's a wonderful book. It's a how-to guide that's needed for every family in this digital age. He is also an ISP, an internet service provider. So if you live in the New Mexico area, you can get in touch with Stephen. Stephen, the name of your company is once again? Higher Speed Internet. Higher Speed Internet. Easy to remember and it's important to have. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you, Logan. I appreciate the opportunity again. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time. This time, until next time, on Spotlight.